His only move to take possession was the dispatch of an officer who advised that the imperial court ceremonial should be ended from that hour, and the empress and the seven-year-old reigning monarch should make ready for a journey to the court of Kublai the Kakan. In this way, in the third moon of the year of 1276, the dynasty of the Sung made submission to the Mongol. The empress dismissed memories and refused to heed the urging of those who could think of nothing but suicide or resistance. She ordered the child emperor to kneel and beat his head nine times against the floor. The Son of Heaven grants you life. She said it is fitting to render thanks to him. Self-abuse should never be part of one's thanks. When the imperial cortege started on the long journey to the north, it was followed by a long procession of families of the blood and scholars of the academy. Bayon appointed four officers to enter Lingan and to preserve under seal all libraries, registers, geographical maps, paintings, historical registers, and edicts of the tribunals. The heart of China still beat, and the treasures of the Ling Nagan remained intact for Kublai's edification. And rumor brought to Kublai's ears the saying of the Dowager Empress, who had named him the grandson of a frontiersman conqueror, the Son of Heaven, as they called. You know, people didn't think that was, you know, it was literally son of God or something. Well, except the Christians thought that. Uh, although, you know, there were times when that was thought of individuals, usually not during their life, though. When specimens of the treasures of Ling Nagan were arranged in his palace, he brought Jamu'i Katun to see the delicate porcelains, the cloth of gold embroidery, and the ivory and coral work. Jamu'i Katan had received the dowager of the Sung kindly and had arranged for the maintenance of a miniature court about the child who had been emperor. When she looked at the captured treasures, she wept. The thought came to me, she explained to Kublai, that the Mongol Empire will likely end like this one day. The fall of the capital and the capture of the boy emperor did not end the resistance of the Sung. The millions of souls in the extreme south were incapable of realizing that the end of the dynasty had come. The war-wearied armies of the Mongols were forced to take uh, forced to new campaigns. Their losses replaced by the contingents of prisoners released by Kublai's command from the chains. Fu Qian was invested, and finally the huge trading center of Canton. Even after the loss of Canton, the Sung adherents carried on the war by sea. The Mongol generals were obliged to outfit a fleet and to invade the islands on which the Sung war junks were based. This conflict on sea ceased after the sinking or capture of 800 junks when the Sung admiral jumped into the sea after drowning the members of his family. No leaders remained to carry on the struggle. The two halves of the ancient Middle Kingdom were now united under the hand of a stranger, and the wars and revolutions of the next centuries did not break this unity. China had become a whole by the conquest of Kublai, the city of the Khan. The Chinese called Kublai Tian Tzu, the son of heaven. At the same time, Kublai was conqueror of the world, overlord of the Golden Horde and the Ilkhans. Did not Abaka at the far ends of the post roads keep an empty throne beside him raised higher than his own while he made public acknowledgement to the courtiers that he did nothing without the assent of Kublai, the Kakan, for whom alone the empty throne was reserved. Kublai was then fulfilling two dynasties. As Mongol Kakan, he occupied China no more than a quarter of the domain of the heir and successor to Genghis Khan. As the Chinese emperor, the son of heaven, he could look upon the distant Russian steppes and the Persian plateau as no more than provinces. Kublai apparently was satisfied by the two roles he played. His appreciation of grandeur was growing with the homage paid him. He had no misgivings. He felt confident that he could give China an administration not only of peace but of reform.
and his ideas of reform were both radical and monumental. You know, radicals, not necessarily anything bad, like, you know, it's used as a term of hate speech nowadays. Actually, that because the dark son of Tului thought in terms of building, he wanted to create new things, not to repair the old. Even while the campaign against the Sung was passing through its last achievement, Kublai was remodeling the northern areas when he rode along the imperial highways and he had elephants now to carry his throne seat with its cloth of gold, ordered lines of shade trees, salt trees to be planted. He resumed the work upon that vast public enterprise, the Grand Canal, that would carry shipping from Yangqing down to the plains watered by Yangtze. This canal was to be excavated, lined with stone, its edges to become stone-paved ways leading past orchards and markets watered by side cuts and shaded by the inevitable trees. It seemed to him possible to check the three great sorrows of China, plague, drought, and famine. He ordered hospitals built in the different areas, and he revived the old idea of storing grain, the surplus of a year of good crops, to be sealed in granaries against a year of drought, and the reserve of grain in an abundant district to be lent to a neighboring countryside where crops had failed or prices had been raised too high. Kubilai had the imagination to deal with the mass of agricultural workers who would have become the slaves of a Mongol of two generations before. He, or his Chinese co-planners, doubled the allotment of land to each peasant and arranged for seed grain and plow animals to be distributed from the public supplies. To gather information as to agriculture, he dispatched a bevy of officials to note down the state of the crops in the villages and the condition of the workers. 